Today's Parenting Great Kids podcast is brought to you by GoGo Squeeze. For a healthy and delicious snack that lets your kids explore, play, and be their best, you've got to try GoGo Squeeze. GoGo Squeeze is made from 100% all natural fruit with no artificial anything. Nothing but orchard fresh apples and other wholesome fruit, all in a squeezable pouch that's ready to go wherever they go. There are over 25 tasty varieties your kids will love and that you can feel great about too. Go, go, squeeze. Fruit on the go pouches. Find them in the applesauce aisle today. And by Life on the Fast Track podcast. From Slate, in collaboration with Ford, comes the new podcast, Life on the Fast Track. Cheer on three Girl Scouts as they design, build, and race wooden cars in the Ford Girls Fast Track races. We'll meet their families, use power tools, and hear what happens when girls are empowered to put STEAM principles to the test. Download and subscribe to Life on the Fast Track wherever you get your podcasts. For 30 plus years, I've seen every type of child grow up. Instead of giving me what I wanted, she gave me what I needed, which was truth. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. Do your very best, and you should have a lot of fun while you do it. And the better you get at something, the more fun you're going to have at something. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode number 49, and I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker. Today, we're going to be talking about motherhood and how to really be present for our kids. My guest is author Erica Komazar, and we're going to be talking with her about her new book, Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. Also in this episode, I'll be featuring a listener question about a six-year-old who becomes visibly frightened by people who look different from her. As always, I'll share my points to ponder for you to start using right away. And parents, as a reminder, don't just download the episodes. Click subscribe, because when you do that, you are joining my parenting revolution and every new episode will automatically show up in your subscribed list. You won't regret it. And we'd love for you to write us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think of these podcasts. I'm doing them for you. Not only are we on iTunes, but the Parenting Great Kids podcast is also now available in the Google Play Store and on Stitcher. So no matter where you get your podcasts, subscribe today and don't miss a single episode. And now on to my points to ponder. First, if you are a mother, being a mom is the most important work you will ever do as a woman. Most mothers want to believe this, but many of us don't because we're fed the lie that the money we earn and the work we do outside our home is more important and significant than the work we do as mothers. Friends, it isn't. As one who has seen thousands of kids grow up over the past 30 years, I can tell you that being a mother is the most important work we women will ever do if we are mothers. We change a person's life. We craft character. We teach a person to love, to be honest, to be giving. Imagine what the life of that little person in your life would be like without you. He or she would be lost, lonely, and have no sense of value or significance. Your child without you would feel hollow, alone, and wonder if his or her life is worth anything. He would wonder whether or not he or she is lovable, but... Because your child has you, he or she doesn't need to feel this way. If you weren't in his life or her life, he or she would be a very different person. Friends, this type of change doesn't happen when you go to work, no matter what you do for employment. You know, as a physician, I give antibiotics, lectures, and I encourage people. But I fully realize that the impact I've had on my patients' lives pales in comparison to the impact I've had on my children's lives, for good and for bad. And in return, the impact that my relationship with my kids has had on me is incomparable. Love matters. Love is what makes us want to get up in the morning and live our lives. Love and relationships change who we are and how we approach our lives. 
Our work is good and it allows us to do a lot of wonderful things and earning money allows us to buy things and, and pay for our homes and education for our kids and cars and gas and food. And I get all that. And it helps us to feel good about using our gifts and our talents. But it is love and companionship and relationships that give meaning to our lives. And that's what we find in our relationships with our kids. These all come from our children and the work we put into our kids' lives as mothers matters. So never let our culture dupe you into believing that anything that you do, even if you are president in the United States, is more important than the work you do in being your child's mom. Second point to ponder, embrace sacrifice that being a mother is entails. You know, the S word sacrifice has fallen out of favor. And we have been taught as women that we really don't need to sacrifice in order to have a great life. That is a colossal lie. We do have to sacrifice. As mothers, a large part of our job requires sacrifice for our children. And that's good. Giving up something to better our children's lives is important. It's part of the job. We can't have everything, at least all at once. We are told that we can have it all. We can earn a lot of money and have a great career and have well-adjusted, happy, healthy kids and a happy, healthy home all at once. Well, the truth is we can't. Over time, we can have a great career and be great moms, but having everything all at once just can't be. When we're raising our kids, we must sacrifice something, either time at work or time with our kids. You know, each of us as women only has 24 hours in a day, and we can't do multiple things well at once. I have tried, I'm sure you have, and we have fallen short. And then what happens when we fall short is think something is wrong with us. Well, maybe something isn't wrong with us. Maybe something is wrong with what we're trying to do. And we're trying to have everything all at once, and we can't. And I want to encourage you younger women that, yes, you can have a great career and you can have great kids, but things have to happen sequentially, not necessarily all at once. I want to encourage you that if you're sacrificing time at work, in order to be with your kids, this is for a season. Your sacrifice will pay off in the form of great relationships with your kids. Nothing that you give up for your kids today will ever be wasted. It will all come back to you three, four, five fold. Or you may be sacrificing something as a mom financially right now. Maybe you have less money than you than you could if you were working at a higher paying job, but you're doing so to have more time with your kids. You will have a great payoff later in life. Or perhaps your sacrifice is that you're a single mom and you're working your tail off to pay for your kids' school or their hobbies. And what you're giving up is personal time with friends or hobbies. Hold on. Your sacrifice will pay off later in life with a better relationship with your kids. Whatever you sacrifice for your children to be a better mom today will have an enormous payoff, I promise, in your relationship with your kids when they're grown. You won't see it when your kids are 10. You probably won't see it when they're 16, but you will see it when they're adults, I promise. Everything you sacrifice for your relationships with your kids will pay off later on in life. Being a great mom requires many different forms of sacrifice, but don't be afraid to embrace those sacrifices. Stick with them. Because what you give up for your kids means that you're investing in their lives and in your relationships with them, and you will see a reward that is better. You'll have a healthier and stronger relationship with your kids when they're grown. Remember, our goal as moms is to raise kids who are healthy adults who want to be with us. Who cares if you raise a kid who's a great performer when they're 25 and 30 and 35, but you sacrifice your relationship with them and they want nothing to do with you because you were never 
with them. You were never present, whatever that means and whatever that looks like when they're young. Third, never be afraid to live differently from your friends. You know, the truth is, ladies, we all feel peer pressure. We all want to do what our friends are doing. We want to dress the way our friends are. We want our kids to do the activities that our friends' kids are doing. We want to keep up with our friends. We see that our friends are working here or there or doing this or that, and we feel that we must follow suit. I've even heard young mother's friends say, well, you know, I work outside the home because that's what mothers today do. If all of our friends work 40 to 60 hours per week in their career, we feel that that's what we need to do in order to feel fulfilled. Don't live this way. Find your path. Figure out what you feel is good and right for your kids, for your family, and stick to your guns. Be tough enough and brave enough and bold enough to live the life that you want for your family. And I can guarantee it will be significantly different from the lives your friends are living. And that's more than okay. It's right and good. Learning to be a strong woman means having the courage to embrace a lifestyle that you want, not one that fits with that of your friends. Because I can guarantee you, ladies, when you do this and you listen to your heart and you listen to your gut, you may find that your friends are going to become jealous. And that's okay. Maybe you will need new friends. When you learn to live a life that's authentically yours, you parent your children the way you want to parent them. You find a job that you believe is right and good for you, or you find a path in being a mom that is good and right for you and your family and your kids, and it's very different from your friends and you're bucking a trend, good for you. You need friends who will accept your lifestyle as good and right and not feel threatened by what you're doing. Remember, if you're feeling criticized or you feel that your friends are critical about you and the choices you're making as a mother, they do so because they feel insecure about what they're doing. They're not criticizing you because what you're doing. They feel insecure in what they're doing, and that's why they criticize you. So if you find that your friends are jealous or critical of the choices that you're making as a mom, maybe you need new friends. Maybe you just need new friends. Never be afraid to live differently from your friends and parent your kids the way you want your kids parented. Parents, we all know that talking with our kids about sex is uncomfortable. And when it comes to having that initial talk with your child about sex when they're about eight years old, I always say in every couple, there's one who's a chicken and one who's an even bigger chicken who just won't have the talk at all. But the truth is, no matter how uncomfortable it is, beginning a conversation about sex early with your child is extremely important because it puts you in the driver's seat. The tricky part is many parents often don't know where to begin or where to end. What if they say the wrong thing? What if they talk too much or too little or use the wrong words? Too often not knowing how or when they should approach approach the topic of sex with their child, many parents just don't do it. And then this leaves your child at the hands of the culture or his friends to teach him about sex. I have created a digital toolkit just for you called How to Have the Talk with Your Child. It walks you through the process of having that initial conversation with your child about sex. The toolkit's packed with a variety of resources and all the information you need to get ready to have that initial conversation, including ages and stages chart to help you determine when to have the talk with your child. There's an ebook on talking to your child about sex, a script to help guide you through the discussion. And for those of you who are really, really chicken, you're the big chicken, it even includes a video of me giving the talk directly to your child. How easy is that? Talking to your child about sex doesn't need to be intimidating or scary. It can be really a great experience and it'll help you establish a strong relationship with your child. I'm excited to offer you how to have the talk with your child toolkit for 20 to 0% off. Just go to my website, megmeekermd.com, click on parenting resources and user code talk podcast when you check out. Parents, this topic about sex is far too important to hand over to somebody else to talk to your kids about. You need to do it. Go to my website, check out how to have the talk with your child toolkit, 20% off 
You need to stay in the driver's seat when it comes to talking to your kids about sex, and I'm here to help. So parents, thanks for listening. This is episode number 49. Stay with us. Friends, I want you now to listen in on a wonderful conversation I had with therapist and author Erica Komisar. She has an extraordinary story to tell about her experiences in teaching women and helping mothers be present, fully present in many ways for their kids. Well, Erica, I am so excited to talk to you today. I love your book, Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. So thank you for coming on with me. Oh, thank you for having me, Meg. This is a bold book. It's um, a book that really advocates for kids and in doing so tells mothers in particular some hard things but some really wonderful things, some important things. You say in your book that we as a culture, really talking about a culture of parents, are failing our kids. And you cite some pretty sobering data. 11% of children, four to seven, diagnosed with ADHD, which has been a 16% increase since 2007. And the two thirds of those kids are treated with medication. That since 1988, there's been a 400% increase in prescriptions for depression given to children over age 12. That the number of teens prescribed meds for psychiatric disorders from 2011 to 2012 rose 19%. In younger children, it rose 19.4%. And that the percent of children under age 12 with eating disorders has risen 119%. Those are statistics that every parent in America needs to hear because, as you point out in your book, we parents can do something about that. Well, clearly we see a problem in our children's emotional and psychological health. As a veteran therapist, you say that many parents are responsible for this and you give some hard but extremely important news and you say, why is all of this happening? Many of us parents are ambitiously pursuing our own individual needs We forget how we evolved as social creatures. Too often, mothers are putting their work and their own needs ahead of their children's. Bam. Wow. That's a hard statement, but it's a very, very important and I believe truthful statement. And I say that as a working mom, and I know you're a working mom. The question I have for you is, do mothers really have that kind of power over their child's emotional health? Because I think mothers don't recognize the power they have in their kids' lives. Mm -hmm. In fact, they do have a great deal of power over their children's emotional well-being and mental health. And it, it is one of the main reasons I wrote the book. I really felt that as a society, we didn't recognize the power that women have. And we do not value mothering uh, as critical and important work. Um, and and it's, it's really one of the main reasons I wrote the book. Yeah. Um, mothers provide such important biological, not just emotional, but a biological function for children um, in the first three years. You know, we know that the first three years is what we call the critical window of brain development. And by the end of that three-year period, 85% of the right brain or social emotional brain is developed in the child. And it is the mother's interaction with the baby and the toddler uh, that really helps to develop that right brain. So you have this very small window to make a really uh, great impact on your child's mental health for the rest of their lives. So you really hone in here on mothers because there there are a lot of listeners out there who are going to say, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. What about the dad? Why are you letting him off the hook? What is uniquely different about the mother, the maternal interaction with a child versus the father interaction with a child? Well, fathers are wonderful, and fathers are also necessary and critical in a different way. And I think in our society, we've become very confused about gender equality and gender difference. So we can be equal in terms of our intelligence, our ability to work at jobs and earn earn a certain amount of money, but that doesn't mean that we're not also different in certain ways. And from a biological level, we are different. And in terms of nurturing, biologically, we're different. Um, Mothers produce something called oxytocin, which is a a neuropeptide, a hormone in the brain that's produced when we are pregnant, when we give birth, when we 
breastfeed and when we nurture. And when we produce great amounts of oxytocin, we also produce it in the baby, meaning when we nurture the baby, the baby also responds by producing oxytocin in their brain. Um, And it helps the mother's right brain to connect with the baby's right brain, we say. And when mothers produce oxytocin, it makes them what we call sensitive empathic nurturers in terms of their behavior. It makes them tune into the baby's pain and meet the baby's distress by comforting the baby. And interestingly, when fathers nurture, they also produce oxytocin, Mm -hmm. but it comes from a different part of the brain and it has a different effect on their behavior. So instead of making them more sensitive, empathic nurturers, it tends to make them more what fathers are in terms of nurturing. It makes them more playfully stimulating and encouraging of exploration and encouraging of kind of resilience, Mm -hmm. which is something we want when we want to encourage separation. But when we're in the very early stages of providing emotional security for babies, we actually want to be more sensitive, empathic nurturers, Mm -hmm. which is something healthy mothers do more naturally than fathers. I love how you explain that because that's the neurophysiology is very real. And neurophysiology and the release of neurohormones in the brain have a very strong impact on bonding. We know that it happens later in life, you know, with different interactions between a a man and a woman, but particularly when you're talking about a parent and a child, this is real science. This really happens. So it's not like we can say this is our opinion, your opinion and my opinion about how babies bond with parents and what happens if they don't bond with parents. But we can really, we can actually see this. I'd like to also point out to listeners, as you describe what happens in the mothers and the babies um, with the release of the oxytocin and the bonding between mom and baby, that this is the way we're wired to be. So this is this is at the core of who we are as mothers, because this is the way our anatomy works. But that when we meet that need and we bond and attach with that baby, not only is it good for baby, but it's good for mom. And so when mom fails to attend to that need, uh, bond with baby, spend enough time with baby, she hurts too. And she may not realize it hurts her as well. You know, because a lot of mothers struggle with, they have to work. I think many feel they have to work more than they probably actually do have to work. But mothers feel compelled to work for many different reasons. I think our generation of women, you and I, have trained them to believe that, look, you can have it all and you can have it all all at once, i.e. you can have an incredibly um, exciting career and you can have wonderful children and a lovely home and great vacations and healthy relationships with your husband and everything. In other words, you can work 40, 50, even 60 hours a week and have these this wonderful, happy family life. But the truth is, that's not true. But a lot of women believe that. And I think that they're trying very hard to do that. And they're short selling themselves and they're short selling their, their children. So talk to mothers out there who are struggling with this work-life balance because we're going to evoke a lot of guilt in them. And our job is not to make parents feel guilty. We're here to help moms be really happy moms and good moms and have great lives. So our job today is not to start throwing darts at mothers and say, you better this or better this. Talk to that mother out there who said, you know what? I love my job. I love what I do, but I love my baby. I don't want to hurt my baby. I don't know what to do. How would you counsel her in your office? Well, again, I think what you just said is really critical and also very brave to say, and I say it in many ways too, which is that there are many mothers who have to work, meaning they ha- they're single mothers or they have to put food on the table and a roof over their children's head, and they have to live in a safe enough neighborhood. Yes. And that's really having to work. And then you have mothers who really have been influenced by a society which has been telling women for three, now four generations um, Um, As Gloria Steinem said in the 60s, if you don't work, you're a traitor to feminism. And so it's really created so much conflict in women, um, not recognizing the value of mothering. And, you know, mothering is probably the most important work because at the end of your life, um, are you going to value the amount of money you've made or the amount of 
material success or professional achievement you have, or are you going to value the people who are sitting by your deathbed, holding your hand, loving you, and being healthy human beings? And so, you know, I think we've really done a number on young women to basically uh, tell them that, particularly in these early years, that mothering is not a valuable pursuit and that um, work Uh, that you earn money at is much more valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece of this, you know, that we really have to look at a society that doesn't value nurturing. But, you know, having said that, you you do get pleasure from all kinds of work. And I think the idea is when you have very young children, rather than your work be the interesting part of your life and your children be the boring part, you want to reverse that. So if you're going to work, you want your work to be the boring part that you have to do and your children to be the interesting part. Mm -hmm. Because one of the main things we want is we want our children to feel that we're interested in them above everything else. So if we're not interested in our children and raising our children, then how can they feel interesting? Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about self-esteem, but we don't talk about where it comes from. Yeah. And I think that we get so mixed here. And I would say the overwhelming majority of mothers listening to us here are very conflicted. And I'm, I'm very proud of those mothers for listening to us and stay listening to us, please. You might be getting agitated and you might be saying, oh, you guys are anti-woman. We're not. Hang on. We're, we're trying to help you live a great life and solve some real intricate issues and problems and, and help you weed through some struggles. Because I remember at 30 and 35 and 40 as a young physician, struggling with, I, I desperately wanted to be with my children, but I put in all this time with my career and I thought, I can't win it either. But here's what I came to realize, and and nobody told me, and I'd love for you to weigh in on this too, Erica, is Mm -hmm. I learned through the help of my mother, who was a full-time stay-at-home mom who I adored, who gave me a great sense of confidence, that relationships that form and shape within the home are your great pleasure centers. They're where you get your great joy. They're where you get your value. They're where you find your sense of self and importance. And if you are ignored there and you come home, and I saw some of this happen to my friends, and there was no one there, you feel incredibly lonely. If a child feels lonely because nobody's there, you and I know, Erica, that a child blames only one person for that bad feeling him or herself. I am lonely because something's wrong with me. Mommy is working not because mommy is mommy, because mommy's great. It's me. Mommy wouldn't leave me and go off to work if something were okay with me. These are real ways children think. And we can't change this because this is cognitively where they are. But I think to realize at 30 or 35, I have all these things that I want to do But feminism hadn't taken hold enough yet for me to say, I don't care about any of you people. I am me and I'm going to chase after Gloria Steinem and I'm going to stand up and scream at people just like she does. She never looked particularly happy to me. Well, she also didn't have children, which was a decision that I think has to be an okay decision for women too. You know, women are between a rock and a hard place because as a society, we don't allow them to not have children and be okay. Exactly. But I think even Gloria Steinem, if we were sitting there having coffee here, would say, if I said, does the great joy in your life come from your relationships over your work as a feminist, Mm -hmm. I think she'd say no question. So it's that kind of that balance. You've got young children and you've got career interests and you're, you've you got these things you want to do, is to realize that my work years, the years that I have to work from 30 to say 70 are 40 years. The years I have to bond and have intimacy with my child are much fewer. They're maybe 18 yeah. and even some less. So if I sort of look at the overall picture of my life as a woman who works inside the home and outside the home. I hate the term working because it makes women feel if they don't get a paycheck, they're not working. It's one of my pet peeves. So is the term working woman. And so to say, okay, now how can I do this in a a fashion that's going to work well for you, child or children, and me? 
and husband, because it's really the preservation and the building of the growth of those key relationships in the home that are your well of life. They really are. So to keep that well filled up and mom is the one and dad is the one who keeps that well filled up. So it's not a matter of, okay, stop your job don't work, cut it off, pick it up in 25 years. I think it can be a matter of I'm going to postpone some activities in my life. And I know that this is tricky from a career standpoint, but it can be done. In other words, there's no reason I don't think you can work a few days a week when your kids are little. And then then as they grow older, you can um, adapt a work schedule around their needs. It's hard, but it can be done. And husbands can help adapt their schedules and work with you. My husband and I did that. We we tag teamed work and I think it was wonderful for our kids. But anyway, give us your thoughts on how a young woman who say 25 or 30, who has kids and has a job, how you would advise her in the, over her next 20 years. Well, I, first I want to say that if you read the book, um, you'll see as, you, as you've read the book that it really isn't a book about working versus not working. It's really a book about prioritizing. So I chose that word very carefully. And, you know, as I said, it, you know, there are many women who have to work and who enjoy some work. It's really about regulation. And if we talk about mothers um, as providing these two really important functions for babies, one is protecting children from stress from moment to moment. And the other is providing them with emotional regulation. Both of those things after three years can be internalized by the baby. On the one hand, in terms of resilience to stress, because we're not born with resilience to stress, we actually learn it from being protected from stress by our mothers in those first three years. And we learn to regulate our own emotions, meaning keeping our emotions from going too high or too low by our mother doing it for us. If we understand that that mothers provide emotional regulation for their babies, we're really talking about mothers learning to regulate their own emotions um, so they can regulate their baby's emotions. So, you know, working is regulation, as you said. It's not that you can't work at all. It's that you want your work to be regulated. Uh, You want it to be modulated in the years that you have very young children, because what I say in the book is more is more. The more emotionally and physically present you are in those first three years, the greater the chance your child will be mentally healthy. And so, yeah, it isn't an issue of working or not working. It's an issue of how intensely uh, you, you work in those years versus the time spent with your children. You talk about, um, because I do think in a small child, one thing that's difficult for parents, particularly mothers, to understand is time. The time concept for a mother is very different than time concept for a child. A child left alone with a nanny for eight hours, that eight hours is very different for mom than it is for child. Can you talk about how children perceive time and why eight hours to a child yes. feels like two days and eight hours to a mom may feel like four hours? Well, you can do a little experiment with your child, um, which is what the attachment research did uh, for many, many years. We we continue to do a research experiment called the strange situation, which is uh, a mother is with a baby and then a stranger get, comes in the room and they basically note the reaction of the baby to the stranger. And then the mother leaves the room and they note the reaction of the baby when the mother leaves with the stranger there and the mother returns. So, you know, the idea is that we, you can do a little experiment. You can leave the room for a moment just to go to the bathroom and leave the baby in the crib or whatever. And you can watch that babies go from zero to 60 in three seconds in terms of their emotions because any separation Mm -hmm. is felt extreme to them is felt. So they don't have um, the ability to, they haven't yet internalized you as a secure, loving person inside of themselves. And so when you go out of the room, you're gone. Um, you, you could say it's like you've you've completely gone, um, like you've died to them. And that's such an important point, excuse me, because you know you're coming right back. Yeah. But a child 
doesn't know that you're coming back. No, and and, they and don't. parents need to recognize that's the impact that your presence has on them that we as parents just don't see. We think, oh, he's fine, he's crying, but I'm coming right back. He doesn't know that, and he in his little brain isn't it developed no. enough to know that. So thank you. Please keep going. And that's why we play things like the peekaboo game because we're trying to create what we call object constancy, which is we're trying to create a sense in that baby that we will come back, but object constancy and playing peekaboo games is something you have to be there enough to do to provide them with the emotional security so they know when you go away, you will come back. But you're right. When you go away, incrementally, children can tolerate frustration, but they can't tolerate Mm -hmm. more frustration than they can bear. And so what we're doing is 27% of women in America Mm -hmm. go back to work after two weeks after giving birth. And, you know, a baby who is so, so very neurologically fragile, um, for them, that time away from you, uh, even if it's, you know, a few hours, Mm -hmm. is an eternity to that baby. You know, there's some researchers that say that we are born nine months too early from a neurological perspective. And the only reason we're born when we are is that, you know, our heads get too big. And now we know that the mother energetically couldn't carry a baby past nine months. The mother the host would die, um, but that we're born almost like marsupials that should be <laughs> worn on our mother's bodies for the first year. In fact, you know, from a neurological perspective and protected from stress from moment to moment. So you can understand how when we leave, it has a tremendous impact on a baby and causes tremendous stress because they have no sense of time uh, in the same way that we do. You look at other countries, too, uh, and particularly uh, uh, third world countries where there's a lot of poverty. Mothers literally strap babies on and they're with them all the time. And I think that lucky child, you know, yeah, Yeah. he's living in a third world country. But that, I believe, is really how we were created to live in this individualism and this separation, particularly when it comes to mother to child, is so unnatural in the best sense of the word. It's very, very unnatural. And I wonder, as I see older kids, nine-year-olds and 16 years old, and I tend to work with a lot of troubled teenagers too, is that I think in those first formative three, four years of life when you're establishing these deep connections and the attachments, that if you don't allow certain attachments to form fully, if that feeds into that sense of constant underlying anxiety about life that causes you to you know, be hyperactive, whatever. I'm just throwing this out there, but I've sort of felt in my gut, there's a, a, a connection. I've done some work in Dominican Republic, for instance, and a lot of people will stand in line for hours to see a physician and kids aren't bouncing all over the place. And it, mm-hmm. from village to village to village to village. And these kids have nothing to play with. And, I, and, I, and, the, and the parents aren't yelling and screaming at them like, behave, behave. And I just wonder if some of that has to do with the, the, the physical amount of time that their mm-hmm. primary caregiver, mom, auntie, grandma, usually mom, is mm-hmm. with them in those first three, four years of life. Thoughts about that? Do you think I'm out in left field? Which I could be. I'm just throwing it out there. No, you're not out in left field. Um, In fact, there's so many things I could respond to you. There's, I think, at least three, maybe four questions in there. So I'm thinking the order of things. Um, You know, when we talk about uh, stress in babies, there's a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is the part that regulates stress in our bodies. And, um, And it's not actually supposed to come online for about a year, Mm. meaning for the first year, a mother is meant to protect a baby from any kind of overstimulation or stress. Every time a mother soothes a baby in distress, she's basically buffering that baby from stress. And as a result, a healthy amygdala doesn't come online until about a year when the baby starts to experience more and more incrementally in very small increments, frustration. You have to introduce some frustration because that's how babies develop the resilience. But the first year is meant to be a year of stress buffering. What's happening now is that because mothers are leaving babies so early, either because they have to, or they, you know, they're suffering from postpartum depression. Um, And you as a pediatrician must hear mothers say all the time, I could never stay home with my baby. I'd be bored. 
And what we don't diagnose as postpartum depression is boredom. Right. Boredom is a sign of postpartum depression in young mothers. And so if we think about the fact that um, oxytocin, that love hormone, has an inverse connection to cortisol or the stress hormone, the more oxytocin in a baby's body, in a baby's brain, the less cortisol. And so when we nurture, we actually buffer children from cortisol, which helps their right brain to grow because that amygdala, that stress alert isn't on. Now we have babies whose stress alarm system is online as soon as they're born. Mm -hmm. And what that's doing is it's causing what we know to be hypervigilance. Yes. And one of the symptoms of hypervigilance is ADHD. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as aggression, because the old fight or flight response, which was uh, in the face of danger and stress and a predator, we either fought the predator or we ran. And so think of ADHD as the running and think of the behavioral problems we're seeing in very young children, early signs of aggression as being the fighting. Mm -hmm. So we're basically putting our children in such stressful positions that it starts very young. It goes straight through their childhood. And I'm, I'm also writing a book now on adolescence, meaning the second period of critical brain development is adolescence, which we now know to be 9 to 29 mm -hmm. uh, from an emotional and brain I love development. It. I love it. I always yeah. said 25. You, you, are, you, are, you are great, Erica. Boy, you and I are in the same camp. <laughs> we are. Wonderful. We are. Because we need to let children grow. We need to give them space. We need to give them, we need to sort of calm their world so that mm -hmm. their physiology and their biology and their psyche can, and their intellect can really grow in a safe way so that we really can launch them. We launch children into strange places, you know, like these, these little tiny balls out of cannons way too early. I mean, I don't even want to get started yeah. on school, but, but I think the stress we put on our children and, and we do it with the best of intentions. You know, parents are trying. I would say every parent listening to this podcast is trying really hard to be a great parent. The problem is they're being given a lot of bad information and they're, and, and we're trying to keep them from having some, from hurt and, and some pain. Let's just back up a little bit because I do want to get into a couple things here too. One question before we jump into how you are a present mother, because that's really, really important. Can you give me a ballpark estimate? And I know this is putting you on the spot, but you're saying how critically important it is to be present physically with your babies and your kids in those early years of life and, and how it hurts them if you're not physically present. And then we'll go into how you are actually more than just physically present emotionally. But mm -hmm. what are the ballpark hours you feel it's safe for mom to be away from baby during those first three years of life or even later where she doesn't have to worry about her child living in this state of constant fight or flight? Well, I'll refer back to my colleague again. None of this is opinion in my in, in my case. It's yes. based on all the research. And, yes. Um, yeah. And so a researcher named Jay Belsky did research in the 80s, and he's continued to do it, um, about the amount of time that children can be separated in the first year of life from their parents without it doing harm. And what he found in his research is that a child who is in uh, alternative care more than 20 hours a week in the first year, when they got to preschool, became more aggressive and showed signs of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so aggression, early signs of aggression and anxiety were tied to more than 20 hours a week in the first year in care away from the primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other studies. Uh, you know, we did a huge study in America on whether daycare was a valid option. And, and I think daycare is the least least valid option because we really don't have any uh, daycare in this country that really is a valid option. Um, it would have to be no more than a three to one ratio. It would have to be a very calm and quiet environment with one caregiver to no more than three mm -hmm. children who is consistent and well-trained and well-paid. And, you know, we just don't we have, have that. It. We'll never no. have that. 
no, we'll never have it because it's economically not feasible. Right, right. And, you know, there was a study that was done that also said that children who spent too much time in uh, any kind of uh, care away from their primary caregiver in the first year became more aggressive in school in the school years mm -hmm. and developed more behavioral problems. So we know that probably more than 20 hours away from their mother in the first year is probably not a great thing. Thank you. That just gives it gives our listeners something to work with, because I agree with you again. I think parents are fed over and over and over. Children are so resilient. Children are just so tough. And I say they aren't. They're not. Mm -hmm. no. You know, they, no. they have to cope. And the coping inside a child who's stressed, who doesn't know what's happening to um, mom or to dad is a chronically stressed child. And that affects them emotionally and it, it affects their neurophysiology and their hormones. Let's mm -hmm. move on. And talk about being present. How can a mother be present with her child when she's with them? So, you know, we can be there physically and not be there emotionally. So there are a lot of stay-at-home mothers who may be there physically all the time, but may be checked out emotionally. But the issue is that you really can't be there emotionally if you're not there physically enough of the time. And so that also debunks the idea, the myth of quality time. You really need to be there in a quality way, a good quantity of time. Um, so, but the first thing I would say is more is more. Be there as much as possible. Remove distractions when you're with your children. You know, we're a very distractible society. We we live on our phones and our computers and our iPads. So put them away. When you walk in the door, put them in a basket and don't pick them up um, until your children are asleep. You know, things like um, once out, once in. You know, parents get confused when they do have to work that it's better if they go in and out throughout the day to see their child. And in fact, it's very hard for children to separate. It's very, very stressful. So it's better that you go out once and come back in once and that they don't have to see you separate from them a second time. So there was a study that was done up at Columbia University about children from very poor families and very wealthy families, affluent families um, and upper middle class families suffering from the same uh, intensity of mental disorders. And the children who did the best with their children in the middle, whose parents were not extremely poor. So they were depressed from impoverishment. Um, but, you know, maybe working class, middle class families who had work, but they would come home from work. And the most interesting thing in their lives was their children. And they didn't go out at night um, because they didn't have the kinds of jobs where they had homework or they had to go out at night. And they were really present for their children when they came home. Those were the children who did the best, the children in the middle. Mm. Um, so once out, once in. Things like pay attention to transitions. You know, transitions are critical for children. Waking, going to sleep, um, any change in activities when you have a toddler going to to preschool, coming home from preschool. These are really critical transitions for children, and you want to be there for as many of them as possible. And then one simple, concrete, ex I mean, there's so many examples in the book, I'm just sort of the, throwing out a few. The, but the book is, the book is every, every person listening needs to read this book because you, it's jammed with wonderful information, and we're just really scratching the surface so, yeah. yes, please keep going. So what one thing I can say to mothers is cradle on the left side. Um, one of the ways that I identify if a mother might be suffering from postpartum depression is if she cradles on the right side. So the research shows that left side cradling is much more connected between the mother's right brain and the baby's right brain, um, whereas right side cradling is a more disconnected, dissociated um, position. Now, we, if we have two breasts, we actually actually have to feed on both yeah. sides. But when you hand a baby to a mother that's not in the in, in a feeding uh, position, and which side do they hold the baby on? Which is their natural instinct? And so, if your natural instinct is to cradle on the right side, try cradling on the left side. Believe it or not, the action of cradling on the left side automatically is going to connect you more with the baby in a social emotional way mm. um, so there's you know I don't want to call them tricks in any way but there are things that you can do very concrete things to connect with your baby don't breastfeed or bottle feed your baby while looking at your phone or yes. the television yes. or your iPad make eye contact with your baby because what we know is that oxytocin is produced with three cues eye contact 
touch and tone of your voice. Mm. Those are the three markers of the three cues to release oxytocin. So if you're breastfeeding and you're not looking at your baby um, or you're bottle feeding and your baby is not touching your skin, you know, I say, if you bottle feed, um, you know, we know that breastfeeding is important for many reasons that are immunological, but really the from a psychoanalytic perspective and just a psychological perspective, breastfeeding makes mothers have skin to skin contact with yes, their babies. Yeah. That's the most important thing, but you can do that with a bottle. I agree. You can, <laughs> skin, you can take, you can take off your shirt and have it that same skin to skin contact with the, with the baby. So, right. I mean, there are a lot of things that mothers can do to be more emotionally connected to their babies. Parents, I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Erica Commissar. We need to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more of my conversation with Erica Commissar. Friends, are you getting ready to tackle your spring cleaning? This year, use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to take on the impossible stains that your sprays and wipes can't. I tried it on my tough messes and it blew me away. Friends, I have used my Mr. Clean Magic Eraser on windows and on bathroom sinks where you get that soapy scum that no harsh chemical will take off. Well, guess what? Mr. Clean Magic Eraser with only a dab of water on it takes off that soap scum. All you have to do is wet it under the tap, give it a squeeze, and it's ready to erase. And because it cleans with water alone, you don't have to worry about harsh cleaning fumes or scents. And I love that about Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. If you're about to take on your spring cleaning, you should definitely try Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It makes cleaning your toughest kitchen and bathroom messes fast and easy. Check out MrClean.com slash podcast to see more ways the Magic Eraser can help you knock out impossible messes around the house. When it comes to bra shopping, it's all about finding the right fit for you. And there's only one lingerie brand that offers bras in sizes AA through G, Third Love. Third Love uses thousands of real women's measurements and super smoothing memory foam to create bras that fit and feel great. While most old school bra brands only carry 15 sizes, Third Love offers 60 sizes, including half cups, which no one else does. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now, they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. To find the bra you've been waiting for, all you have to do is answer a few simple questions from Third Love's Fit Finder quiz. It only takes 60 seconds and you can do it all from home. Never have another awkward fitting room experience again. Try a Third Love bra. It's so comfortable, you might forget you're wearing it. And if you don't agree, returns and exchanges are easy and free. This year, make the change that will change the way you think about bras. Go to thirdlove.com slash Meg now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash Meg. Thirdlove.com slash Meg. How about being more present for a three or a five-year-old? Or and, and older mm-hmm. children, how can a mother be more present? You know, if I had written the book that I really wanted to write, I probably would have written a book called Being There, Why Prioritizing Your Children in the First, you know, 18 Years yeah. Matters, and no one would have bought my book. I would have read it. I, split it, it yeah. I know. I split, I've split it into two books, which is the first period of critical brain development, and the next one is adolescence, because you really do, the brain is rewiring reorganizing and it's it's both growing and pruning in adolescence so you have another chance and as you said if you got it right in the first three years adolescence goes a lot easier for children but so does the in-between period between three years and nine years that period also goes much easier for children if they get a good foundation um and it, it, it's generally harder for children if they don't have that is it impossible to repair um maybe not being there as much or maybe if you had to work or you were distracted or you were depressed in those first three years is is it all lost and the answer is no You can do a lot of repair between three and nine. And then we know that period between nine and 29, there's a tremendous ability to do a lot of repair. And I think that 
what happens in the early years is parents make decisions that they would never have made five or 10 years down the road. And they look back and I think all of us parents do that. Why did I do that? So from just a practical standpoint, how can a mother, uh, um, let's say she works part time out the home, outside of the home two days a week, and all the rest of the time she's with her children. What kind of practical things can she do with her six or eight-year-old to make sure that she's there for her child? She's emotionally there because it's very hard because we adults are hit with so many distractions as well. We know put your phone down. I get annoyed with my girlfriend's phones when I'm trying to have a conversation or coffee with them and they're on their phones and I'm a grown up and I don't even need them, but it irritates me. So talk about some practical ways that mothers can be there for their for their older kids, please. Well, again, whether you're dealing with a very young child or an older child, you want to do um, what we call emotional reflection. And to do it, you actually have to be emotionally present. So sort of like breastfeeding, which forces you to be in a position of skin to skin contact. Um, you know, when you do emotional reflection, which is you look at your child and you see what they're feeling and you let your face like a mirror reflect what they're feeling. If they're sad, you allow your face to be sad. And then you use your words to put into words what you see. You look sad you know, did something happen to make you feel sad? And that kind of emotional reflection, if you kind of force yourself to do it, I'm thinking you override your desire to look at your phone by actually focusing on your child and being interested in your child's emotions and doing emotional reflection or what we call mirroring. It actually forces you into a position of having to pay attention to your child's emotions. Um, And it engages part of your right brain. Um, You know, the problem is that, again, we're three or four generations into which women whose mothers were conflicted or not that interested in mothering. And so what we know about mothering is it's passed down generationally, meaning if you had a mother who was very empathic and could reflect your emotions as a young child, you have an easier time doing that with your own children. Whereas if that part of your brain didn't get developed, then it's much harder to do it with your children, not impossible. Um, And, you know, we know from research that therapy actually restarts the development of that part of your brain that may not have been developed by your mother in the first three years. So one thing I encourage mothers to do if they're struggling to move away from their distractions and pay attention to their children is go see a therapist. And I know that mental health is an issue in this country and there's not enough therapists and not enough affordable therapy, which is a real problem. But, you know, um, we, we know that that works. We know that talk therapy can really help mothers to connect with their babies. Mm. That's wonderful, wonderful advice because it's, I, I think every mother wants to, but we're living in a society that's so distracting um, and we feel so busy and that we're, there's this motor running I see in mothers, including myself, at times going, I've got to this, I've got to that, I have to, have to, we always feel behind. And it's really hard for us to focus um, and be present with our children when we're feeling behind. One of the things I think that helped me as a reader of your book was to sort of tap into my own sense of, okay, my kids are grown and I have grandchildren, but when my husband's here, what I want most from him is for him to be present with me, to to acknowledge that I'm in the room, to to listen to what I have to say, even if he's bored, to, you know, give me a hug, even if he's not paying attention. So I think one of the things that helped me as a reader that might help parents is to think, what is it that I want from the person I love most, the adult I love most? What do I want from that person? I want them to, and particularly women, we want husbands to look at us. We want them to be affectionate. We want them to hear what we have to say. Um, And if we just try to say how much we want that from our husbands and then turn to our child and say, how much more do our kids want that from us? That just kind of helps us understand how to give by first tapping into what do we want, at least start there and and then how to give that to your kids. Play is another way that children often don't communicate their feelings always with words, but they do always communicate through play. And so um, when parents play with children, get on the floor and really engage them in that way. Um, There's a great deal of 
the kind of interaction and communication that can happen because that is the language of children. Play is so important and, and to me. Play outside if you can. There's just something about fresh air and being outside that's that's so wonderful. Well, Erica, our time together has just flown by. I am just so grateful for your wonderful book, Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matter. And I can't wait to read your next book because you are right on. I think there are so many parents that are hair's breadth away from doing things extremely well in parenting, but it isn't until they are able to get hold of books like yours that go, aha, here's how, now I get it. And I can really promise parents, and I'm sure you can too, once you move into that lane of parenting really well and attending to a, just making a few small changes and attending to your child's needs, life in the home gets so good. I mean, it's hard and, but you know, your kids are happier and you're happier and things just, things just go the way they were really meant to go. It's, it's so much nicer. Can you um, give our listeners three tips, just three, three, three simple things to do when they turn off the podcast and also please let them know how to get hold of you if they want to connect with the work that you're doing? So um, three simple things I think you can do right away are think about your distractions. I think we talked a lot about that, you and I, and I think that is a really critical part of being present. You cannot be present with someone if you're on your phone or on your computer or even on the telephone, you know, in your house. In the old days before we had, you know, cell phones, we had telephones. So, you know, remove distractions when possible. Pay attention to the transitions and be there and be present for as many any of those transitions, sleeping, uh, waking up, going to sleep, um, any change in activities for a child as possible. Um, and try cradling on the left side. So those are three just concrete things parents can do. And there's so many more things in the book, I think, that they can look at to do. Um, and in terms of getting in touch with me, my website is www.comisar.com. And you can buy the book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble online and many, many bookstores. And and um, yeah, and reach out to me, please, if you have questions. Well, I st- I think this is one of the most significant parenting books that we're going to that's going to be around for the next ten years. I feel very, very strongly about that because your message is bold. It's not opinion. It's backed by scientific data, and that's what I love about it. Because as a physician, I too everything in my mind that I say to my patients or that I instruct my patients. Really, it doesn't matter what my opinion is. What matters is what science tells us about children. And we have to speak the words to parents that children can't speak. And so many times that's, please, dad, please, mom, I love you. I want you more. Please, I want you more. And most parents go, okay. And, you know, doing that is is not nearly as scary and daunting as we think, but we're not living in a world that that helps us do that very much. So thank you, Erica. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having me, Meg. I really appreciate it. All right, parents, let's get social. I want to hear from you and I want to interact with you. I love answering your questions. You can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. Or if you have a question, send it to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Today, I have a question from Lisa who writes, Hello, Dr. Meeker. I'm concerned about my six-year-old granddaughter. She lives at home with both her parents and her younger brother and is well-adjusted. Last year, she started ballet class and she loved it. There's a young boy who also attends a class who has progeria. My granddaughter screamed and hung on to her mother each time she saw him. She discontinued ballet because her mom was concerned the poor boy would be traumatized by her daughter's reaction. She talked about it with her daughter about special needs and even looked it up on the internet about young children with disabilities in order to desensitize my granddaughter. She responded positively to the conversations, but she crumbled in fear each time she saw the young boy. Lately, she's been terrified of people with missing limbs. My daughter recently took her to a Pennsylvania farm show and there was a group of wounded veterans that stopped her in her tracks because of missing limbs. We're stumped by her behavior. Lisa, your granddaughter is entirely normal and kudos to her parents for helping her deal with her fears. Many children are innately frightened by a person who looks different from them. 
Unfortunately, parents, however, have a hard time with a child's honesty with their reaction, especially when it's as dramatic as your granddaughter's. You know, progeria is frightening for children and it's frightening for adults because it pushes a lot of buttons in adults who feel sorry for a child or they grieve for the parent of the child who has a disability, an illness like progeria. But adults, of course, have social skills that are well developed that prevent us from displaying our feelings. And of course, this is very good. What I would encourage you to do as a grandmother is to help your granddaughter learn to understand that differences in people are good and that everybody is different from her. Help her to respond to situations around her where she feels confused about the implications of having a difference like a lost limb or an illness um, that she might see in a child or an adult. And there's some specific ways that I think you could help her with her parents' permission to get over her fears. And again, I would encourage you to talk to her parents about continuing to expose her to people who are different from her. I would choose adults and see if you could find some adults, maybe some veterans in your community, some people in a hospital, a nursing home, perhaps, who you could visit who may uh, have a disability like a missing limb or who may have a, um, a mental health handicap and expose her to those people and just sort of talk to her about their issue. And um, if you have a faith, maybe you could help her learn to pray for those people. If she can talk to them about their disability, that's even better. Um, maybe you can find a a person with a missing limb where she could just go and visit with that person. Veterans are wonderful people because who, Um, veterans who have had some type of war trauma and lost a limb or have a handicap are wonderful for your granddaughter to be able to talk to because they um, sacrificed or lost a limb doing something very noble, serving our country. And you could talk to her about that. But if she can actually talk to the person about what life is like with a disability, all the better. Second, don't shy away from helping her with her fears. You know, as we talk to our kids about their fears and we sort of normalize fears, we take the power out of them in a very meaningful way for kids. Your granddaughter isn't too young to learn to deal with fears. So just talk to her very openly, and honestly about why would that make you afraid? And what does that make you think about you? And do you ever worry about um, having something wrong with you or many children Uh, six, seven, eight years of age, worry about something happening to their parents. What would happen if mommy lost a leg or if mommy had an illness? So talk to your granddaughter uh, through her fears in a very open and matter of fact way and listen to her as she talks. But again, I would strongly encourage you to talk to her parents before you do that, because they may want to do this. Remember, finally, it's going to take your granddaughter time. So the fact that she's having difficulty getting over her fears within a couple weeks is normal. So it, it, it's going to take her months to become comfortable talking about children and adults with disability. I encourage you to just keep at it or help her parents to keep at it. Parents, I love answering your questions. And I want to encourage you, no question is out of bounds. I love tough questions. I love talking about things that nobody else wants to talk about. So nothing is too uh, embarrassing. Nothing is too difficult. Keep sending me your questions. Email me any question to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, that's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. I want to thank my guest, Erica Komisar, and encourage you to read her wonderful book, Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. Let's recap my points to ponder. One, if you are a mother, being a mother is the most important job you will ever have as a woman. Number two, embrace sacrifice in your parenting. And three, never be afraid to live differently from your friends. So remember, until next time, parents, great kids are raised. 
not born. Hey, this is Bobby, producer of Meg Meeker's Parenting Great Kids podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening to episode 49, Motherhood and Being Present for Your Kids. And thanks to you, Dr. Meg's Parenting Revolution has grown to over a million downloads. You can like Dr. Meeker on Facebook and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. As a reminder, go to MegMeekerMD.com and sign up for her newsletter for giveaway opportunities and updates. And don't forget to share the podcast, write us a review, and click subscribe so you won't miss an episode. 